Hey everyone, this is Danielle with the Great Lakes Beacon. I am here with uh, Patrick Colbeck, Senator Patrick Colbeck from Canton Township. He's a Republican candidate for governor. Um, yeah. Thank you so much for, for taking the time with us, Senator. Good to be I appreciate with you. it. Yeah. So, uh, I guess for starters, can you just tell folks a little bit about yourself, your background? Yeah, actually, I'm relatively new to politics. <laughs> Um, my background is actually aerospace engineering. Went to the University of Michigan, bachelor's and master's degrees in uh, aerospace engineering. Went on to the International Space University in Strasbourg, France, where I studied life sciences. And actually, one of my instructors was Buzz Aldrin. Um, that led to a job out at Boeing, uh, working on the International Space Station. I was responsible for the environmental control and life support subsystems. Um, and uh, also uh, the airlock module and did cabling design and quite a few other things, integration of uh, various equipment inside the, uh, in the airlock. So it was a nice little international endeavor. That was my fun job. <laughs> that, I worked out at space camp as well. I taught out there and then I came back to Michigan. That was out in Huntsville, Alabama. I was working for Boeing and came back to Michigan, my wife and I, and uh, um, I was contracting for a while with the Department of Defense as a uh, systems engineer. Also uh, worked for AAR Cargo System, where I headed up their program management department and turned their operations around. Took that and went into management consulting, and for 11 years I was doing that, the last six of which I was on my own as an independent consultant, going off and troubleshooting companies that are having trouble with uh, planning and project management in general. And so, then this fun thing. <laughs> so why did you decide to run for governor? For me, it's a call of faith where they got me into politics in the first place, and that call is not over right now. We've got a lot of solutions that we put forward. I like to refer to them as principled solutions for Michigan that, uh, frankly, have been sitting out on the table. We've gotten a lot of things accomplished, but we've got a lot more that we would like to get done um, based on the simple premise that the government's supposed to work for us, not the other way around, that whenever we go off and provide um, solutions and appropriations, it's meant for the best interest of all of our citizens not for a select few with the ears of the power brokers up in Lansing, which gets very frustrating. Article 1, Section 1 of our Michigan Constitution says it's supposed to be for the equal benefit of all, and I think we fall short on that quite a bit. And the last part, the last principle I'd highlight is uh, something that gets to the idea of personal freedom, and that is taxation should all, or tax increase should all be the last option pursued, not the first option. And up here, people are all too ready to go off and dig into people's wallets as the first uh, option. And so, um, I'm looking forward to actually be able to implement a lot of these solutions going forward. They're all on the table. We're doing some things out right now that are a benefit to a lot of uh, Michigan citizens, but I'd really like to have an opportunity to kind of direct uh, those policies uh, going forward. And as governor, you got a little bit more sway than one of 38 senators. <laughs> So um, on the policy issues, what, yeah. what would be your top three policy issues? Healthcare first and foremost. Right now we have a direct primary care Medicaid pilot. As you probably know, uh, Healthy Michigan is not so healthy right now. It's got a so-called poison pill embedded in it that once uh, the um, so-called savings for Healthy Michigan go below, go negative, and once the federal contribution goes below 100%, um, the Healthy Michigan is automatically repealed. Well, what I've been promoting is a way of actually going off and supporting people on Medicaid in a more cost-effective manner that actually does something extraordinary, it actually keeps them healthy and keeps them out of the hospital. And it's called my Direct Primary Care Medicaid Pilot. And it focuses on preventive care and getting access to people that need, um, that need access to good quality care. They're not getting it under the current Medicaid system because mm -hmm. physicians get reimbursed about 17 cents on the dollar. So you can only keep so many Medicaid patients on the rolls without going belly up in your business operation. So what we do in this model is that we um, emphasize a direct relationship between a physician, primary care physician, and a doctor, and the uh, patient for the primary care, which is about 80% of the healthcare transactions you see. And when you do that, what you find is that the remaining 20% of those transactions regarding catastrophic care, like chronic illnesses and hospitalizations, that goes down. That's the expensive stuff. So for a little bit of investment up front with the preventive care, we actually save a lot on the back end on the order of 20% uh, or more with what they've seen. And so when you're talking about an $18 billion Medicaid budget, I mean, that's $3.6 billion that could be put towards other purposes. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, eliminating the state income tax is one of those purposes I'd like to do. It's about a $9.7 billion hill to climb right now. And if you've got a $3.6 billion start to that, um, that's an option to go off and uh, 
and make a significant dent in that. Now, I'm not saying you, you cut the income tax to zero with a one piece of legislation, right. but I've provided a milestone-based, systematic, as soon as you achieve the milestones, you lower the, you ratchet down the, inter, the uh, income tax percentage step by step by step. You keep whole schools, you keep whole uh, police and fire as you go through it, because you know there's a lot of restricted funds and games between general fund and restricted funds. You've got to manage along the way. But I think that's something that a lot of citizens would appreciate an immediate mm -hmm. four and a quarter percent pay increase. Right. Um, and by the way, that gets rid of the pesky little uh, senior pension tax right along with it. So, and I've made a commitment to make sure we do that, and I've got a plan to go off and nail that down. Auto insurance rates actually dovetail into both of those issues because um, we get into the idea of uh, lowering the cost of insurance, in particular around health care. Um, if you look at your health insurance or your car insurance bill, which I have recently, that's about a $1,300 a year bill that I pay. Well, about 500 of that is for the car. The rest is for me as an individual. It's health insurance. So if you lower the cost of health insurance in the state, and I, that's part of what we're talking about with this direct primary care, if you expanded that principle across the whole state, you've got an opportunity to uh, um, save a lot of money for everyday citizens as, uh, as well, which couples with the lowering of the income tax. And now we're starting to get to the point where we're easing the burdens on everyday, everyday uh, uh, families. So, that's really what I want to try to do. Right now, I've gotten the impression, and from my seven years in service, that special interests are kind of ruling the roost. I think it's about time that we started um, showing consideration for hardworking families that are, I think in many ways, uh, getting the short end of the stick on a lot of these deals. When you have things like the Good Jobs Bill, for example, mm -hmm. and it sets a threshold of 3,000 employees, do you think that's helping small businesses? I don't think so. Mm -hmm. um, and even the transformational brownfield projects, you think a small mom and pop shop with two to three people is gonna be competing for those transformational brownfield projects? I don't think so. It's exactly the wrong policy. So I, I think you're gonna see, number one, healthcare reform. Number two, you're gonna see a push to eliminate state income tax. And you're gonna start seeing more broad-based economic development policies that benefit everyday families as well as um, all the businesses in the state because we're all gonna be raised up equally. And um, that's, that's something I'm pretty passionate about. And, and if folks wanna check up on my rhetoric on that to match it, I mean, go to morninginmichigan.com. All my floor speeches are out there. And I just, uh, I, I'm actually one of those candidates that uh, is gonna be running on my record, not trying to reinvent myself for the campaign. Good. Uh, what would you, and, and on that note, I, I suppose, what would you say makes you different from your, your opponents? Oh, well, I mean, probably not something Progress Michigan viewers want to hear, but uh, the key thing is Ronald Reagan, I'm a big fan of him, and he asked us to all go paint in bold colors, not pale pastels, which means you don't do this little 0.35% income tax reduction. You go for the whole enchilada. And that's what I, I think is the biggest difference, is that I will paint in bold colors. I think the rest is as politics as usual. And I think uh, a lot of people in that last election, no matter what side of the political aisle you're on, there's a lot of frustration with the politics as usual crowd. So on the Democratic side, you had Bernie Sanders, who was the outsider candidate, if you will, that was appealing to folks that were dissatisfied with what was going on. And you had Donald Trump and Ted Cruz on the other side that tapped into the same market. And frankly, that's the same motivation that got me into politics in the first place. And it's, it was very frustrating. I'm tired of the folks that are elected to serve us not actually representing us. So I may come from a different worldview perspective for, as a lot of people, but the end game is the same. I want to alleviate, uh, I want to work in the best interest of all of our people and use proven methods, um, using that engineering problem solving approach to benefit everybody. Well, you, you're hitting right on every one of my next questions. Oh. I was just going to ask uh, how you think you could bring people together because political tensions are at such a high. Oh, yeah, we saw that on the Senate floor today already, too. I think um, here's an example of something that we've been successful in bringing people together, the new social studies standards. Um, about a, two years ago, I took a gander at what was being proposed at to the State Board of Education for new social studies standards, and I, I thought that... Uh, the new standards were not accurate. I thought that they were not politically neutral. So I got together, wrote a letter, highlighted specific changes I'd like to see in the standards. Um, got other 16 other legislators to sign it, sent it to the State Board Ed and MD, and they responded by um, forming a focus group. For the last uh, year and a half, I was engaged in that focus group, and we'd have full day sessions. and. Let's just say I, I was uh, outnumbered pretty much 20 to 1 from a worldview perspective, but 
what we did is I just set up two simple criteria that everybody in the room got engaged in. Number one, that it's got to be politically neutral. And number two, that it's got to be accurate. And so that focused a lot of the discussions from the typical demagoguery that you'll see in these political discussions. And it got to the point of saying, all right, what really is going on here? And let's represent all views. And I'll give you an example. So if you, there's a section on uh, civil rights. I was talking about LGBTQ as civil right that has to be talked about. Well, you know what? Where the real rub is in today's current events is that that's bumping up against people's religious conscience and religious views. Well, the current, the previous standard didn't have that bump, bumping up against, the, against mm -hmm. that at all. So I said, let's have a full discussion. Let's get this. This doesn't happen overnight where it's just one right popping up where people are are confused. We want to make sure that we had a balanced discussion over where people are coming from. Because if you want to understand why there's conflict, why there's divide, you've got to hear both sides of the equation. And my concern, why I think we see a lot of this acrimony and divide, is because we've only been talking about one side of the equation in a lot of our schools. And I think it's about time that we had a more balanced discussion. That's one of the reasons I promoted the campus free speech bills. Mm -hmm. And if you want to talk about bringing together two diverse sets of opinions, I got ACLU in support of legislation and I got the Goldwater Institute. So it is possible, but the key is to come up with some shared objectives around um, the truth and get people, you know, I, if we'll have a debate, have a, but bring, bring the data, bring the support for it. Another example is uh, you know, one of the things we were discussing on the uh, social studies standards was what do we call our system of government, right? It was democracy, for, and, and I said, I think we're a republic and constitutional republic at that. I said, you show me where you've got proof that says we're a democracy, and I'll, I'll show you on republic, and I'll say, you know, I've got the Article 4, Section 4 of the Constitution. <laughs> I've got our Pledge of Allegiance. I've got Ben Franklin after the Constitutional Convention. I got the Federalist Paper number, nine, number 10. Um, show me where the proof was for democracy. And when we got into that discussion, they said, well, actually, um, the only proof I have is that that's what's in our textbooks. I go, really? <laughs> do you have math textbooks that said 2 plus 2 equals 5? Because if we do, we've got to get them out of the classroom. <laughs> and so, you know, we got to a long discussion over that and uh, eventually came up with some compromise language that says we are a democratic form of government, there's no doubt about that, but technically we're a constitutional republic. And um, I put in the constitutional prefix for a very important reason, is that not only are we a representative government, i.e. republic, but we're bound by that constitution. I, I can't go off and draw any play I want on the playbook here. I have to operate within the guidelines of that constitution. And sometimes I don't think we do a good job of doing that in the legislature. Um, what would be your plan for ensuring residents in urban centers like Detroit and Flint um, have a good quality of life, especially because they face so many issues of water shutoffs, closures? Yeah, I think, um, first of all, not, it's going to start with good education and making sure that um, people have access to good quality education because that leads to new opportunities, gets them out of the cycle of poverty, it gets them into good jobs and elevates the whole family, the whole neighborhood so you don't get into some of those discussions. I think um, the other part of it is we got to make sure that we've got responsible government happening there. So we've got an issue with what happened in Flint, we had issues in Detroit. There's a lot of this back and forth of state versus local funding and all this kind of stuff and I think to a certain extent, a lot of the locals have some points in regards to the state not meeting their financial obligations for local units of government. Mm -hmm. And uh, I got that, uh, I got exposed to that early on as uh, working with um, Senator Papa George and general government. And we had this concept of the EVIP program that the governor rolled out. Well, I saw a lot of these local units of government actually doing the right thing, and they were still getting dinged <laughs> on the financing. So I think one of the things we need to do is start shrinking the size of state government and making sure that the folks who know what's going on, who can provide the most different, uh, make the most difference to every, people's everyday lives or local units of government, I want to make sure that they have better revenue sharing, if you will. And uh, I, um, for example, they know where the roads are that need to get fixed. Right. Folks up in Lansing, eh, no, they're going to take care of the state trunk lines, but they're not taking care of the neighborhoods, they're not taking care of the mile roads, they're not taking care of the county roads as much as we should be. And that's, that's where people are feeling the pain right now on things like roads when it comes to sewer systems. Those are also the folks that know when we're having issues with sewer systems, like what happened out in Macomb County. Mm -hmm. They're also the folks that understand what, what schools are working, what schools are not working. So. 
you'll see a big push for local control and letting the people, now there's got to be accountability on that because one of the problems we've been running into is that we've got excessive OPEB and uh, other obligations that go on in some of these communities and we can't let them run themselves on the ground like what happened in Detroit. We can't continually go in and do bailouts on it. Um, so I'm a big believer in making sure we have transparency around the financial situation of all of our communities because once people understand what really is going on, then they can make informed decisions and the folks who are voting for local officials can make better informed decisions about who they should keep around and who they shouldn't. So um, really it's a matter of just kind of doing a little bit of a rebalancing on the state, the size of the state government versus the size of the local government. And I can tell you right now there's a, there's a concerted push to actually squeeze out a lot of the local units of government. Um, and uh, I don't think that works well for our, our republic. <laughs> um, our next question is uh, your position on prevailing wage. Yeah, I'm in support of a repealing prevailing wage. I am, matter of fact, when we get into minimum wages, probably on that question there too. Um, it's the same idea. It's a, um, this is a case where uh, we actually disincentivize some things that are, are pretty important because I, I actually treat them as kind of related issues on it. You actually squeeze people out of the marketplace that could actually provide a competitive product at a more um, um, fiscally responsible or competitive price, which means that we can, in the case of prevailing wage, it applies to building schools and, and other municipal buildings. Right. Well, if you want to stretch taxpayer dollars and get more of that infrastructure to provide for the same people we were talking about before who are struggling with access to good quality infrastructure in some of our lower income communities, well then we've got to make sure that we've got an ability to kind of provide more of that infrastructure and repealing preventive wage, or prevailing wage is actually one of those options to uh, go off and provide those opportunities for those communities. Now you're, you're big um, on direct primary care. Do you have a position on uh, single-payer health care? Um, diametrically opposed, and I'll give you a breakout of a kind of a philosophy on health care, but it applies to a lot of different other areas in regards to government. Uh, you, uh, you've probably heard of Milton Friedman before, and he has a nice little breakout on all economic transactions that kind of shapes my philosophy in regards to what works and what doesn't work. He breaks all economic transactions into a first party, second party, and third party transaction. Mm -hmm. So a first party transaction, I'm using my own money to pay for something that I'm going to use. I'm concerned about cost, I'm concerned about quality. Uh, second party transaction, when I use my own money to buy something for somebody else, like a birthday gift. Right. And let's just say there's a reason why people re-gift. <laughs> yeah, the cost is important, but the quality, eh, you know, it's got to pass the <laughs> sniff test sometime. The third party transaction, this gets into the point where you're using somebody else's money to pay for something that somebody else is going to use. You don't care about quality, you don't care about cost. And all government transactions, especially under a single payer system, fall under that third party transaction model. So one of the reasons direct primary care works is because the end consumer, the one who's actually paying the bill, I mean, we've got a little bit of a special case here with Medicaid, but, um, but the one who's paying the bill is the one actually involved in receiving the services. And what we're seeing is you've got, number one, competition. Number one, you've got the best quality of service that's going on. Um, and, it, and it works. And so the closer you get back to that model of, of operation, the, the better off, I th the more we can stretch limited government resources and provide people the services that they need. And um, education is, is, of course, a, a big focus for yeah. a lot of uh, folks separate among parties, of course. Yeah. But, um, what is your, your position on trying to improve uh, charter school accountability? Well, I think it, I don't target any specific area for accountability. I want them all to be treated uh, on a level playing field. And actually, there is a kind of a lot of misinformation going out there that we address pretty much my first term um, in office where I went off and I compared statutory language for every um, education delivery option that we have. So charter schools, cyber schools, traditional public schools, parochial schools, home schools. And we just broke out what are all the statutory guidelines across the board on all of them. And most of the time when we hear emails or we get emails or get phone calls from people, it's not, they're, they're kind of saying, hey, it's not an equal playing field. Well, yeah, it's, in some cases it's not an equal playing field, but not in the way that you think it is. <laughs> and, and so I, um, I personally want to kind of go back into that model of that first party transaction and get the consumers of education 
more responsible for how that money is actually directed. So the idea of school choice, I'm very passionate about making sure we have choice because I think that more accurately reflects the spirit of that first party transaction, which is going to get us better quality for, for lower costs. So I want to preserve that model of operation. Um, and uh, I don't know if you saw the legislation I put out recently, the enhanced MESP program legislation. What that did is actually provide an opportunity to provide more money for public education. It actually incentivized um, the creation of student-specific tax advantage accounts that uh, could be used to go off and defray costs around public education. So um, when I did the analysis on these accounts for the DPS bailout that happened, I calculated we could have had over $3,000 per pupil per year added into the kitty for the parents of Detroit Public School students that they could have either provided for services uh, provided by DPS um, or they could have gone to third parties and express and, and gone off and used that money for, for that. So I and the debt servicing alone was $1,500 per pupil. Uh -huh. That left another uh, incremental $1,500 per pupil. And by the way, if we extend that opportunity to all students across the state, it, it opens up the doors to um, additional funding without raising taxes, without raising fees. Um, and uh, it's, I, I, it's something that I think is uh, something that uh, is thinking out of the box. It's innovative. It's kind of getting on that aerospace engineering mindset and trying to find new ways of, of addressing um, objectives that we all hold in common. So if we want to find out ways to go off and get more money in education, I'll, I'll, I'll meet you uh, on that objective, all right? Okay. But let's find a way to do it in a way that's most effective, and these enhanced MESP programs really help out in that regard. And uh, so I'm, I'm excited about getting that moving. I think it's, uh, and it's just for public schools. It's not for parochial schools. It doesn't apply. We had a parochial school um, president, Mike Curry, come in and testify in support of the bills, but it, he was just highlighting how this is what's done in parochial schools. They, they actually use these mechanisms. We're just letting the public schools know about it so that this is something right. that they might be able to leverage. And oh, by the way, this helps out with more than just funding. It actually, one of the cornerstones of this is that it opens a door to work-study programs supplementing education funding. So there's companies that will provide uh, sponsor students at $7,000 per year um, per pupil and uh, in exchange for like five days of work per month. Mm -hmm. The kids get experience right. figuring out what kind of job they want. I was a co-op student when I was uh, at University of Michigan. That's how I learned what courses I should take in subsequent years right. because <laughs> I, I didn't have any idea what an aerospace engineer did when I went in aerospace engineering. That same opportunity ha um, provided with kids in the high school level and they can kind of chart their own path and direct their own path. and um, and then we also have 32,000 job openings in my area alone. And uh, I, uh, it would be nice to be able to have some good qualified applicants that know what they're doing, that have a leg up on what you know, these businesses are looking for so that they could tune their education path to satisfy some of those objectives. So, and that's all them driving it, not somebody in an ivory tower or something saying, hey, I think Johnny needs to be an engineer, Susie needs to be a musician. That's the wrong way of doing it. We want to get the choice back to the parents then, and the students because then they're going to own that career. They're going to own that decision. And um, that's what we're really trying to get back into is uh, more and more get out of this state-based or national-based um, decision-making in education and push it more and more back to students, parents, and teachers. I, I, it's so, I see it in all the different policies that are over. And that's the most frustrating thing that I've seen in education <laughs> is that this ivory tower me you know, mentality. And, that every we had at the beginning of this year, we had all these folks come in and say, "What really turns around a school district? What, what denotes educational excellence?" Mm -hmm. And it, none of the evidence of a turnaround came from somebody from Washington D.C. coming into the classroom and saying, "Look, I know everything that needs to be done in this classroom. Just listen to me, and everything's going to be fine." No, what it took was parents and teachers rolling up their sleeves, saying, "Not on my watch." Johnny's going to get a good education. We're going to make sure that he gets to school on time, that he's got the proper materials to go off and do it. It took that community-based um, energy to get things across the finish line. And, and right now, the more we kind of tie those, put strings attached with all those local control efforts, the, the more we're hampering those efforts. All right. Well, that's actually all the questions we have, so I appreciate it. Thank all you so right. much.
Well, thanks. Hope you guys have fun with that. <laughs> sure. All right, thanks.